Thank you so much. Good evening. Thank you all for being with us here in person. We are grateful to everyone who made this event possible. Uh, we're especially uh, grateful to the whole staff of the Center for Earth Ethics, who I will thank in person at name by name at the end, and to everyone at Union Theological Seminary. And also we're grateful for the support from the American Indian Law Alliance and Tribal Link. And we encourage everyone to look them up to follow their work and to support their work. We know it's become a bit more challenging to gather in person these days, but we really wanted to do so for this because the publication of this official report on indigenous peoples and the right to freedom of religion or belief is a powerful occasion for a topic of utmost importance to our purpose as a center. We're also live streaming this event and so we say welcome and thank you to our audience on live stream. The author of this important report, former Special Rapporteur Professor Ahmad Shaheed, is with us to offer a keynote. And then we will hear from four distinguished respondents who belong to indigenous communities from the four directions of the region which many call Turtle Island. Of course, we are aware that indigenous peoples live all over the world and the report is indeed global. But these are the voices that we will hear from on the subject of this report in this forum this evening. The responses are from Betty Lyons of Onondaga Nation and Haudenosaunee Confederacy, Bernadette Demientoff of the Gwich'in, Mona Palaka of the Havasupai, Hopi, and Tewa, and from the Special Rapporteur on Indigenous Rights, Francisco Kali Sai of the Maya Kachikel. We are so honored by the voices of all of these respondents. And after they have spoken, we will welcome to the stage the current special rapporteur on freedom of religion or belief, Professor Nazila Ghana, who, and apologies if I mispronounce any of these names, who officially presented the report at the United Nations yesterday. Shortly, we will hear opening remarks from Reverend Fred Davey, who is a leader in many ways, including of this great institution, Union Theological Seminary. For many years, Reverend Davey served as executive vice president, and he now serves as strategic advisor to the president, and he's always been the most stalwart, insightful, and just downright helpful uh, supporter of the Center for Earth Ethics. So we're, we're honored and delighted that he is here. Fred Reverend Davey also works in the world in extraordinarily meaningful ways, always seeking to make things better for all people. Notably, he is a commissioner on the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. So we are grateful to have him here in all these capacities as, as a colleague, mentor, and partner in the work we do. And we look forward to his words of welcome to Union. But first, we acknowledge this place in a deeper way, as the territory of the Lenape people. On Earth Day this past spring, President Serene Jones made several commitments, one of which was to install a plaque that would reflect the sentiment that is genuinely deeply felt and growing in this institution. And so this plaque, a temporary version of which is outside uh, this chapel, um, it falls to me to read the words of it and share them with you tonight. Union Theological Seminary acknowledges and honors the land on which this building stands as the homeland and territory of the Lenape people, as well as the habitat and dwelling place of the many beings they have been in relationship with. We give thanks to all of the spirits of nature. We pay respect to Lenape people's past, present, and future, and express support for the flourishing of indigenous peoples and life ways within this place and everywhere. I want to thank the members of our larger community who offered feedback and guidance on that plaque, including the members of the Ramapo Lenape-led Sweetwater Cultural Center. And now we are blessed and honored to receive words of indigenous welcome from the Tadadaho of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, Sid Hill.
so the Hunsi Yostak and Jokwa. Now, yeah, some Gawa, some Gawa, this is a neon Gawa, thank. Now, I didn't have to take the neon Gawa, the Gesh, Kadahne, and neon Deka. Now, go and what the Yatan, they're going to hang you. He did again Gawa, and Dakwa, to know, and then got a Gotta, and they'll hang the Gawa for Dekwi. And down at Gawa, Tony went out, that Tony went to take that, and scan the eye, do not do on your hick. Down at Gawa, need the young Gawa, the Gay, and Gawa, you see, and Tony. It's God of Twain, what Nico ha, eat then do a dear that then do that no ha, down at the deed, and I take them go on Nico ha. And down a yat to how when Jad died, I need to know her, need to know Hanko, to know her and toss it out near eat and go out again hasa, to know the young white way hard and the young white Nico he was stuck with. And down I ate it, and then what how with Kaya soon got the what then did he sat on his go be honed up. And down I did with what they know, yeah, scarred and do I want to go have what you know, have it, you know, hats up when jarred it. Night patone, a way with that hind down on it, some white decide. Down it to deep near take from what they go have. And down there, what you know, her name, it's at you where I am, I name Uncle who say you're stuck with. Night Uncle Toy and it, nine again, they'll tweet no knee. I ain't eight or odd, who win again, it's gonna add gone to me. I told God, it went dark on it, told you where we are. And down I did with what they know, and yet, scarred the hand, do I want to go ahead with the eighteen or hand, it's at you where we are here. Down it to the eighteen, and they don't go on the go ahead. And down I hold her question, go ahead, and they got to go with her doing you. And I get, we hold one, and one of the horn, that's to go with her connection. And the other day, the eighty saw the other one of doing this, he got to go on the ten eight dark. And down I open it, said, watch you in the car, I have got. And I got to know it is so the soon car guy got down it to yet there and just to know why you. And I know we have one it's at noon, you have not the hound. And I did what do we saw you. I saw one of the two what they end yet, it's at noon, you have not the hound, it's at going yard it. And down I did with what they know yet, scarred a hand to I got to go have for the tinner hair. And I got to get there, I saw one of the two what they end yet, it's at noon, you have not the hound, it's at going yard it. Down it to the deep now, they don't go on the go home. And down there, so go yard dog when they can yen you get together, you can't yard. To not to and you saw no talk not beside. The cheese of the no one yet saw her in a dah. Now you have a hot dog, you have to in a house. I yago yard to go and you know why yet saw her and yard. And I say, Nadia did not need that. And I have so go yard dog when they can yen you get together, you can't yard on it. Ah, we are going to say, No one and yago the year. And down all night, who did the white shoot, they got me go her kissing. And I own it. Um, I got dark when they said, Walk on, and not this can your dial. I need her how in it, how I not this and why it is high. And down I did with what they know, yeah, scar the hand while I want to go ahead. The tin I had a guy in your quit to get the key at yard, and I caught told it. I said, What I had, I said, What to walk on, and not this can your dial. Down it to the inner take on going to go ahead. And down at Saturday, we have seen it soon quite beside. Night away, I went to get them saw up, and then soon I had it. To know when to go to the park, I knew to go to the side. And I had it to the doctor. When the day was Sunday, the angel was set to hard in it on a white cluster. And I had some good excuse in it, young girl, when it's some go out in the other other tea water. And I did, but there was only to ask on some one away court. And down I did with what they know, and yet, scarred the hand on what never had. I said, well, now I have a new one, I have a new one, so I'm going to say, I have to do it, and 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 I have to do it. So that's the, uh, that's our traditional greetings any time our people gather uh, in the Confederacy. This was done in Onondaga. And you'll, you'll you hear these uh, same words in all the other six languages throughout the Confederacy. And at this time, I'd just like to acknowledge Chief Perry and welcome him to his, to his land here. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure back, back before contact that we had an agreements, treaties, understandings. And before we would come into the, anyone's territory, I would, we would probably build a fire outside and wait for them to welcome us in, you know, so. But things have changed, and uh, but we still acknowledge each other and uh, give thanks that, that we uh, still have this relationship and make it stronger as we go. 
So it's just, uh, so that's the, uh, the kind of hand that, that's been done. Like I say it's the Anadaga language. And, uh, just like to welcome everybody to this, to this seminar and all this knowledge that will be shared. Thank you. Thank you, Tadadaho, for that moving and important uh, welcome. Thank you so much. And thanks to all of you uh, for being here this evening. As um, Corinna said, I am uh, Fred Davey, Reverend Frederick Davey. I'm Senior Strategic Advisor to the President here at Union Seminary. Uh, and again, I want to welcome all of you here. Uh, on behalf of Union Seminary and our President, the Reverend Dr. Serene Jones, uh, we are very pleased that you have joined us for tonight's discussion. Uh, Dr. Jones, Serene, uh, is truly disappointed that she can't be here, but she's actually recovering from COVID, so, um, and from a pretty lingering case of it. So we remember her in our prayers tonight as she recuperates, and on behalf of her, I welcome you here. I want to also acknowledge uh, the Center for Earth Ethics, and particularly my colleague and friend, uh, Corinna Gore, for organizing this forum uh, and for doing the work that they do. It's been a real blessing to Union uh, to have Corinna in our midst for a decade or more now uh, and for, for, to have this important work that she and her colleagues at the center uh, do uh, on behalf of uh, the issues of environment and ecology and uh, people's lives and roles in, in the midst of that. And it, it, it is a, a, a great blessing to Union to have you, Corinna, your staff, and the center, and the, the work here. Beginning with the religious, Religions of the Earth Conference in the fall of 2014, and through the official founding of the center in the spring of 2015, Corinna and her colleagues have focused on discerning the moral and spiritual dimensions of the ecological crisis, including the urgency of understanding the root causes of climate change, and advocating for necessary changes in laws, policies, and social norms. From the beginning, a major part of CEE's purpose has been to uplift, support, and learn from indigenous communities. Tonight is in keeping with that intention. Union has a proud legacy of convening and guiding discussions about public issues of grave moral concern. The issue we are discussing tonight that is, respecting and assuring legal protection of indigenous people's spirituality and ways of life is a vital part of that legacy and is fundamental to our seminary's educational mission as well. I have the additional interest in tonight's forum, as Corinna acknowledged earlier, as a commissioner of the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom. USERF, as we call it, is an independent bipartisan U.S. federal government agency created by Congress in 1998. USERF monitors the universal right of the freedom of religion or belief, mainly abroad, and makes policy recommendations to the President of the United States, to the Secretary of State, and to the United States Congress and attracts the implementation of these recommendations. We are nine commissioners appointed by the president or the leaders of Congress in both parties, supported by a nonpartisan professional staff. While our commission is independent from the State Department, we are proud to have the ambassador at large for religious freedom as a non-voting member of that commission. Let me just make one other point before I introduce our speaker, and that is that at the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, we believe inherent in religious freedom is the right to believe or not to believe as one's conscience leads, and to live out one's beliefs openly, peacefully, and without fear. Freedom of religion or belief is an expansive right that includes freedoms of thought, conscious, expression, association, and assembly. While religious freedom is America's first freedom, 
It is also a core human right international law and treaty recognized. Now our keynote speaker tonight is uniquely qualified to discuss the issues of freedom of religion or belief, Dr. Ahmed Shaheed. You can access his full biography in the program, but I would like to remind everyone that the, of the Urin Report that is the subject of today's meeting is just another milestone in a career devoted to international service. I actually looked at Dr. Shahid's resume online and it is quite impressive and if you haven't seen it, uh, I'd, I'd call your attention to it. The report is the product of Dr. Shahid's second mandate as Special Rapporteur at the United Nations where he also advises the Office of Genocide Prevention. He is currently Professor of International Human Rights Law at the University of Essex in the United Kingdom, where he directs the Religion and Equality Project, among other responsibilities. Sir, we are delighted you, that you have traveled so far to be with us tonight, and I present to you Dr. Ahmed Shahid. Dr. Shahid. Very good evening uh, to everybody. I hope you can hear me all right. Um, first of all, uh, thank you very much, Tadadaha, uh, Tada for the very warm welcome you just uh, gave to all of us, including me. Really honored to have rece received that. I also want to thank Commissioner Davey for the very kind words he said about me. And of course, to Karina Go for inviting me and your team for enabling me to be here and of course uh, uh, convening this important conversation. I am really honored to be part of the eminent speakers this, this evening, including my very eminent successor, Professor Najila Ghania, and my colleague who will join us on, on, on my former colleague who will join us online, the special reporter for Indigenous Pe Pe People's Rights, Francisco Charlie Sai. Um, and of course, all of the speakers, and really pleased to meet all of you tonight, and look forward to hearing from you. Uh, your reactions to my report interest me more than me I will tell you about what is in my report, which of course was presented yesterday. And I was, I was, uh, I was able to observe the interactive dialogue yesterday at the third committee. I was very pleased with the initial responses to the report. There was a range of uh, responses, uh, but by and large, it affirmed Obviously, you know, we all know this, but at the UN level, affirmed in third committee, the discussion on freedom of belief that the rights of indigenous peoples mattered and should be examined and should be followed upon was very heartwarming for me. Of course, the challenges were also very clear as some states continued to be in denial or typically finding problems elsewhere and not within them, when it actually requires all to acknowledge that all of us have things to do in our own part of the, if you like, you know, uh, uh, in all mandates, in all areas, to make, to address issues that I have raised in, in the report. So um, following that presentation, and part of my purpose for coming here as the author of that report, is to hear from all of you here um, about what can be done next. Uh, what are the next steps for us to move forward? Because this report is designed to be a conversation starter. It's designed to open if you like, a whiteboard for writing. You no, know, let's write what we can do next. And what really interests me is what all of us can identify as what we can do next. And of course, doing, uh, uh, doing that. But before I get to what's in my report, I want to very briefly, of course, I'm sure all of you know about this, but briefly speak about my former mandate, um, which is part of the UN Special Project System and what that system is about. And then I will uh, elaborate about why this report is significant in my, in my view uh, for the UN system and beyond. The methodology I used for developing this report, it wasn't a UN expert saying what he thought was best. Uh, as I typically do, my aim is to platform voices often not heard in the space that the UN has accorded me as a mandate holder. 
and of course some of the key findings and recommendations in, in my report. As many of you know, special procedures work is done by independent experts. We're not, as, as Mena told us, I was not a UN person. I was an expert the UN assigned some work to do. And our job is to be independent, credible, and to be, in my view, the conscience of the world. That is to say, we, we, we offer our views without fear or favor to any state or any stakeholder. We just speak what we think is the objective truth, or at least try to achieve that and speak from, from that perspective. And uh, the experts in the system, from 50 plus now, they cover other thematic areas like privacy or my previous mandate, freedom of general belief. And there are, of course, country specific mandate holders, uh, examining countries like Iran, very much in the news presently, but there are uh, a dozen other countries with a similar situ a, a, a situation. And of course, they are tasked with reporting to the UN, to the Human Rights Council, a report, and many cases a report to the General Assembly, as the uh, case of my, my report this year. Beyond that reporting, they can also receive communications from uh, survivors and victims of rights violations, and then present uh, those situations to governments, demanding accountability, seeking responses, seeking uh, remedy and redress for those who are affected uh, uh, by, by that. And this, of course, advocacy function, in addition to specific cases, is also linked to awareness raising of governments of their obligations, of others of their, of their rights, and of all of us on what all of us can, uh, can do. This includes an awareness raising function, educational function, which can use a variety of tools, including very creative ones. Music is also coming into the scene. But very often today, social media, which can be a very powerful tool uh, in, in, uh, in mobilizing, event, uh, mobilizing people to action on issues of concern to everybody. Human rights requires solidarity to be effective, among other things. And awareness raising is a huge, hugely useful tool to build that awareness. Now, in addition to independence of the mandate holders, credibility also requires engagement with the stakeholders, especially with the rights holders that they are talking about, embodying the litmus test of what we have stressed as nothing about us without us. So it requires that, you know, we have a communication channel with the rights holders, we collaborate with them, and then uh, we want to take forward from there. That's why for me this even tonight is so important. It offers a platform for my eminent successor, and of course for me as a person who's done this work, to see how we can follow up working with you in how we can uh, implement uh, those aspects that many of you had communicated to me uh, are necessary and important and useful to uh, actualize uh, your, your rights. Of course, special reporters are required uh, to apply international standards, uh, human rights standards, both as a yardstick for analysis and also as a way to um, you know, uh, recommend measures. And very often, the mandate that I held, called uh, Mandate on Freedom of Religion or Belief, is incorrectly perceived by many as promoting religion. Nothing can be further from the truth. The mandate isn't about promoting a religion or a belief system. It's about promoting a human right rights that all human beings enjoy equally without discrimination. So it's not about religion, and of course, um, it involves uh, be uh, believers and non-believers, rights holders are, in fact, uh, everybody. Now, of course, Article 18, as I said, my report, Article 18 of the ICCPR, which is the primary article of the Human Rights Covenant uh, on freedom of belief, um, it protects followers of every religion or belief system. Um, but there is this question, often asked, raised by many, does that article, does the framework apply to indigenous peoples? And of course, the answer is yes, it applies to um, uh, every human being. But because indigenous peoples were historically excluded from the design of these documents, relevant of international law, very often these documents read as not including the concerns of these communities. They were shaped by interactions among, amongst perhaps world religions, if you call them, but certainly hegemonic discourse about what, what is a, a religion. And therefore, there is that gap that has to be addressed in terms of how we can best apply um, these standards. And for me, it's not a question of bringing people to the standards, 
It's about the standards embracing people in, in, the, in the diversity. We have to have, find a way to make sure that we are including uh, uh, everybody. So in this work that I had done, I was guided by the UNDRIP, a declaration very much developed together with indigenous peoples around the world in human rights standards uh, framework. And of course, in consultation with uh, groups around the world, indigenous peoples around the world, here in the US, uh, I traveled to Arizona, for example, I had meetings in Washington, uh, and then in Canada, in Norway, uh, we had consultations uh, in Kenya, uh, uh, Gr Greenland, but also many online consultations as well to make sure that I was able to really engage with rights holders and communicate their concerns in a way that made sense uh, uh, to you. So these, the findings in the report are drawn from these consultations, uh, in addition to, of course, working with human rights defenders in your communities, uh, policymakers, experts in academia, and of course, government officials, even experts, uh, and, and others covering all of the five UN geographic regions. So I tried to be as broad-based as I could possibly be. Uh, so 25 consultations covering all these uh, re uh, region, uh, regions. And I received 80 submissions. Uh, most of the civil society actors to my call for submissions issued uh, in May and June uh, uh, th this year. So at the beginning, I want to say a huge thank you for all of you who contributed to this report. On my own, I am not aware or not, not really able to you know, say anything meaningful because you know, I need to learn so much about this. So I'm immensely grateful for all of you who did the educating that was required for me uh, in doing this report. So this also brings me to the reason why I did this report. And for me, like I said at the beginning, the purpose of the report is because there's a cognitive gap, because there's an application gap, I need to to see if I can initiate a conversation, a sustained conversation between communities promoting freedom of general belief and of course advocates for and communities within uh, indigenous peop uh, people. So the communities, the lobbies promoting this freedom in, in some parts of the world, in the UN itself, and of course indigenous peoples around the world in terms of how they can work together uh, to ensure that rights of everyone uh, is equally, uh, are equally uh, protected. So for the rest of my time tonight, I won't talk about what I have. I'll just go through what, what are the key things I have in the report. Of course, in the report, I stress the understanding that indigenous peoples and their private uh, diverse regions are impossible without acknowledging. I mean, my point is that we really can't appreciate the situation of indigenous peoples without really examining, understanding, and acknowledging the historical and ongoing experience of discrimination, violence, hostility, that threatens their physical existence, but also their cultural physical self as well. So understanding the broader context of, of uh, discrimination, exclusion, and the historical legacy, continuing legacy of that is an important uh, starting point. That's a lens through which you have to understand the rest of the issues that, that we are raising. So I, I stress that particular point. And of course, beyond straight restrictions on their sacred ceremonies, languages, and generational transmission of knowledge, challenges the enjoyment of freedom of belief, encompass their forced assimilation and displacement. And that's a reality that is ongoing. Violence against environmental and human rights defenders and destruction of sacred sites without their free and prior and informed consent. That is still happening in many parts of the world. Given the inextricable link between land and the sacred for many indigenous peoples. Many believe that restricting the access to land, this happens again for often commercial reasons, is tantamount to prohibiting denial of the exercise of their spiritual experiences, fundamentally put it under international human rights law. But that delinking of the, of the land from, from the people, that's an important violation, a signal violation of, of, of their right. And throughout the report, I highlight how states and non-state actors often lack the understanding and recognition that spirituality for many indigenous peoples is conceived as a worldview of living harmoniously with nature, linked intricately to their identities, well-being, cultures, and livelihoods. This, often, this lack of understanding often occurs detriment and disadvantage of indigenous peoples including where claims of freedom of belief are rejected before domestic courts because the frameworks the courts use 
don't fit into these lived experiences of indigenous peoples. So that works against the detriment of indigenous peoples and, and, and their, and their uh, rights claims. And while human rights are interdependent and indivisible, this is especially true, evident for indigenous peoples whose spiritual worldview governs every aspect of their life. It cannot be a forum internal, as we say, internal existence and out outside manifestation. It's totally integrated. And so that for a formula we apply of a, of a two-part right really denies the actual existence of, of, of the right for, the, for, the, for these communities. And the indigenous way of life is intrinsically intertwined and cannot be divided into frameworks of you know, categories of, that we widely use international law. And while all human rights are interconnected and mutually reinforcing, the intersection between culture and indigenous freedom for indigenous peoples is particularly important and is often uh, drawn into uh, at attention. My report also highlights the impact of protecting the environment as an important element of protecting the freedom of the belief of indigenous peoples and how their destruction and degradation undermines their very existence. Whereas indigenous peoples are often disproportionately vulnerable to environmental crises, including climate change, many are, of course, uniquely positioned as custodians traditionally to use their spiritual and knowledge to sustain nature. So the many of the global challenges you're talking about have their answers by seeking the knowledge of indigenous communities who are custodians, who have been custodians of these, of these lands of, of nature throughout centuries and millennia. Um, experts constantly expect the best way to protect nature is to protect the rights of those living there. So if you, protect the, if you want to protect the ecosystem, protect the lives, rights, livelihoods of those living there. In every, every region I, I consulted, indigenous peoples shared with me their challenging experience of state and non-state actors restricting their access and use of traditionally, often spiritually, significant territories, including through forced evictions, degrading their lands through extractive and development projects, and declaring so-called fortress conservation projects. So in the name of conservation, again, laying the path of this destruction by denying access to these communities whose very existence is tied uh, with, with, with these, if you like, you know, spaces. And indigenous environmental defenders in some part of the world face systematic violence and rising violence for and when carrying out their vital human rights work. So defending their own rights to existence and the environment often is met with direct violence against these, uh, the, 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 these defenders. Indigenous peoples represent one quarter to half of human rights defenders killed, as documented by in, in various uh, statistics. We have serious concern about attacks on human rights defenders, and a large proportion of that, one quarter of that, are indigenous rights def defenders. You can see how the, the, the exclusion, the, the violence that is, has been historically is still continuing in some ways, some ways. And this violence remains unrecognized often and generally unremediated. Disregarding indigenous peoples and loss of their languages as source of and of knowledge, again, misses valuable opportunities for biodiversity conservation climate mitigation, sustainability. Again, the reservoir of knowledge about how to preserve these is lost when the language is lost through often assimilation practice or whatever that state's fit is important to, to subject these communities to. So that this connection again, loss of, loss of language. Some said to me, you, we lose our language, we lose everything. We take our language, we have nothing. That the connection with others, with land and space is, is gone. So these policies have such a devastating impact both in the communities and also our efforts of others of protecting the planet's biodiversity. Inherent link between these two is often not recognized. I speak about, again, how inseparable from this, from concerns exercising freedom of belief, our contemporary crisis of survival facing many in this people. Again, our concern globally of rising religious persecution. We often miss how that is linked to our failure to recognize the crisis facing many of these peoples. As Professor Garnia noted yesterday in her uh, presentation, disproportionately high rates of poverty, ill health, socioeconomic discrimination, degradation of the environment, and forced displacement, 
and empowering lots of civic and political participation. All of this exclusion is part of the global crisis that we are facing. Again, although the uh, global population of Indian people is on 6%, they account for a very high proportion of globally impoverished communities. Some 19% of extreme poor come from these communities. It has been worsened by COVID in the past uh, two and a half years. My um, previous report to the UN two years ago highlighted the importance of, importance of making sure that no one is left behind in realizing everybody's rights, but certainly in regard to that report, religious freedom. And again, I cannot stress again the way that we are marginalizing, excluding, undermining, destroying in these communities is totally opposed to the, the philosophy, the strategy, the policy of leaving no one behind. Again, I want to stress that Im I important point. Many Indian peoples struggle to survive in a culture of widespread and systemic disc discrimination. Let's alone on their rights, including religious freedom. I came across many examples of scapegoating, widespread scapegoating, stigmatizing, and negatively stereotyping Indian peoples and their spirituality, again further marginalizing and, and, and putting pressure on, on these communities. Among younger generations especially, again, forcing them to assimilate or trying to assimilate them to succeed in broader society, again, thereby forcing self-censorship, reducing their spiritual practices, and undermining uh, the quality of their life, and of course, you know, both their own freedoms, and of course, freedom fears that moving forward, we'll be losing our reservoirs of traditional knowledge, which are so important for all of us, for our survival. Uh, the report calls, recalls international frameworks on the prohibition of incitement to discrimination and violence based on one's identity, religion or belief identity as guided through a six-part test in the Rabat plan of, uh, plan of Action. But we see quite often societies have de deployed language such as witchcraft, folklore, paganism, devil worship, anti-development to characterize indigenous uh, spirituality, to deny, as we heard earlier, equal participation of indigenous peoples in society, including access to essential goods and services, and even justify violations of a broad range, including, of course, freedom of you know, belief and non-discrimination. And this, of course, leads to harmful practices that target these communities, including dehumanizing rhetoric, disinformation, and derogatory tropes that travel from the offline to online and back, and, of course, in the offline, uh, offline world into real harm against these communities. And all of these violations are occurring in a climate of denial of access to justice. Worldwide interlocutors from every region observe the disconnect between state rhetoric, where there is a rhetoric about justice, and actually the actual practice, the reality, which states fail to recognize and uphold rights of these communities, including, of course, in regard to my report, freedom of you know, belief. Such shortcomings are often born from complicity, com from complicity or denial of responsibility. Either way, there's significant concern about state behavior uh, in this area. And whilst our states must ensure effective remedies to victims of rights violations, interlocutors often describe currently available options as inadequate or inappropriate for remedying past wrongs. In other words, insufficient or inappropriate to meet, uh, to, as, uh, to meet the concerns that they raise about past violations, especially about forced assimilation and displacement and the impact that they've had on these communities. These communities uh, often face obstacles in effectively advocating or uh, producing evidence of those violations, including the demands that they produce circle records from colonial times for, uh, through cultures of secrecy and voluntary isolation. That again, of course, also puts impediment. In other words, asking to meet standards that are designed for communities which are differently situated, and also to asking to meet standards that have resulted in violations of, of their rights. In other words, it's quite a, quite a paradox that the, the, uh, those who have destroyed these uh, links are asking communities who are victims of this destruction to demonstrate that they, such links did exist uh, in, in the past. My report does highlight uh, extensively on the gender dimension uh, of, of, of freedom of belief. And one, one concern of, of one is that hegemonic discourses often otherize communities 
um, in one of the situations as painting these communities as rights violators. But often we forget that hegemonic uh, groups have imposed their misogynistic views on others and now reflect back on these communities and blame them for this. So the, the experience of the past had destroyed the equitable value systems of these communities and imposed upon them intolerant ones and now they are held to account of, uh, to, for these new forms that have been imposed upon them and are stigmatized further uh, of, 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 for this. Now, I don't want to go on and on. The, the report uh, is online uh, and it is uh, 10,000 words long, as a lot of uh, information packed, packed in there. But the key thing uh, I, I argue is that in the UNDRIP, we have specific articles that outline the understanding of indigenous peoples of the right to freedom of general belief that has to be used to, in our work on religious freedom to ensure that their understanding of these rights are also actualized. So I'm hoping that there will be a closer reading of these texts, bearing in mind the concerns raised by indigenous peoples about their situation, so that there is, there is really an equal enjoyment of this right by everybody everywhere uh, in the world. And what really intrigues me now uh, is to hear from other interlocutors who are better placed than I am now as a former mandate holder to follow this through. But I do I want to promise you that because many of you came forward and opened your hearts to me and shared your experience with, with me, it meant to be forever. And I shall continue to work on this, work with you, collaborate with you, offer all my collaboration to you as well in working uh, towards implementing the recommendations in, in this report. Thank you very much. Please welcome Betty Lyons, President and Executive Director of the American Indian Law Alliance and a member of the Onondaga Nation and the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. That's my original name. My colonized name is Betty Lyons, and I'm a proud citizen of the Onondaga Nation. First, I, I want to uh, acknowledge Chief Perry and thank him for allowing us to convene here this evening um, to Mona, our elder, who has come to be with us tonight, too. Um, Roberto Barrero, who is also a leader in his community that has joined us as well. So I want to thank them um, for being here and being well. To the Special Rapporteur Ahmed Shahid for the interim report on the freedom of religion or belief given at the 77th session, I, I humbly thank you uh, for your important work. Um, we will be using this document going forward. As I said earlier, it is refreshing and um, made me very hopeful <laughs> um, in a long time that, that we haven't seen a lot of hope coming from some of the reports um, you know, out of the UN. So yes, thank you, we're very grateful. We acknowledge and send our gratitude for your dedication and efforts made in reaching out to indigenous nations, peoples and communities to be open to our perspective on how we define, practice, what is referenced as religions and belief. Freedom to practice our ceremonies, languages, cultures, they are intrinsic to the quality of our lives as indigenous peoples. We feel it goes a step further. We believe that it is a value system, one in which is needed for our mutual survival. It is important to understand that the notions of religion and belief are two areas external to us as indigenous peoples. It is not the belief, but our sacred relationships to the natural world. As we breathe in right now, oxygen into our lungs that came from the trees that are outside, um, part, part of what we do and part of what you heard our Tadadaho do was to give thanks to, to all of those sacred beings that, that provide us and sustain us. And therefore, it can't be separated. It's, it's part of who we are. It's part of our DNA. Um, and embedded in, in who we are as, as indigenous peoples. That is what is important for us because it's, an, it's tangible. We see all living beings as relatives and not merely resources. 
Creator exists in all living beings, not some external being elevated in a distant space. And what you just heard from our Tadadaho, the Haudenosaunee Thanksgiving Address, are the words that come before all else. And it reminds us of our responsibility, respect, and reciprocity between indigenous peoples, Mother Earth, and all living beings. Indigenous peoples have a mandate to speak for all those things that can't speak for themselves. And thank you for your understanding that any actions must take all genders into consideration and listen to the marginalized voices. The Haudenosaunee Confederacy is a matrilineal society. We understand the need for balance and inclusion of women in religion and cultural practices. I also want to thank you for confronting anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and the problems that are happening with, throughout the world. Um, even the denial of indigenous peoples on other lands. And as you know, there is so much work that still needs to be done. Examining the report in item 10, you mentioned that an international definition of indigenous peoples doesn't exist. And we agree with you that member states often use these definitions of ind indigeneity to erase us and, and negate our participation in all international fora. It reminds me of something our, our Tadadaho often says. They severed our tongues so that we couldn't speak our language, language and then punish us for not being able to speak it. We know all too well that a tool of the colonizer was to make us an enemy by demonstrating that we didn't hold the same religious practices such as Christianity. If I can get the paper to move. It was necessary to label us as witches, pagans, and Saracens in order to dispossess us of our lands and sacred places. The United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is an important instrument. The Declaration is not a legally binding instrument, and the principles contained therein are based on human rights standards contained in other international instruments that are legally binding and we will continue to push for the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples to become a covenant. The critical success of UNDRIP, UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and all the rest of the work of international nation-to-nation -nation and treaty relationships rests in the acknowledgement of the territorial integrity and the rights of our Mother Earth and the full recognition of Indigenous people's sovereignty. The special relationship between Mother Earth and indigenous peoples must be protected. We acknowledge the General Assembly's resolution on the harmony of nature, and the report acknowledges the limitations of human rights framework. The re recognizing that a number of countries consider Mother Earth the source of all life and nourishment, and that these countries consider Mother Earth and humankind to be indivi indivisible living community of interrelated and inter dependent beings. These types of relationships cannot be properly categorized within a human rights framework. Instead, we operate under our own traditional pre-colonial way of life, guided by the teachings of our ancestors and preparing the way for the seven generations yet to come. We also agree that there is no definition that includes all religions. Fundamentally, the categories of religion and belief will always remain Christian categories and there needs to be acceptance, not mere tolerance. Protection of these freedoms are paramount. The great paradox of religious freedom in international affairs is that systems already exist for appropriate protections. However, indigenous nations and peoples are discounted, excluded, and ignored. We are not seen as being properly institutionalized religions who worship in churches and have a clerical hierarchy. Until UNDRIP becomes legally enforceable, we need to continue to utilize the Universal Declaration on Human Rights and other instruments as long as the protections include those that are not included in institutionalized belief systems. The Doctrine of Discovery for Report. Under the report key findings, we appreciated the acknowledgement of the effects of forced assimilation. We have suffered from the dispossession of our lands, access to vital resources, and forced separations from our spiritual and sacred places. It certainly reminds me of what's happening with Onondaga Lake, that is our sacred, um, our sacred site where 
our peacemaker came over a thousand years ago to bring the message of peace, bringing our five warring nations together. And it is still one of the most polluted lakes in the entire world. Um, and, and it should matter to everyone because it's the birthplace of democracy. Forced assimilation and dispossession are two key components of the doctrine of discovery, as your report notes. And the doctrine of discovery remains alive and well. The American Indian Law Alliance has and will continue to ask for a full study regarding the effects of the doctrine on all indigenous peoples. And it was the founder of our organization and special rapporteur of the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues at that time, Tanya Ganella Fritschner, that delivered the preliminary study on the doctrine of discovery in 2010. She asked for a full study at that time, which has yet to be conducted. We ask the Special Rapporteur to kindly support these efforts. Those affected by the doctrine are not just oppressed, but also the oppressors. As Indigenous peoples, we understand root cause analysis and the global rise of white Christian supremacy is a direct result of the unaddressed violence of the doctrine of discovery. All of these things are so interconnected, murdered and missing Indigenous women, um, as you stated in your report, boarding schools. You know, an ongoing crisis in indigenous communities is the continued kidnapping, sexual assault, and murder of indigenous women. And far too often, the police and lawmakers are not only complicit in these attacks, but also are the perpetrators of these attacks. Women in my own extended family have been kidnapped, murdered, and to date, the case, cases still remain cold. Boarding schools, every single indigenous person alive on Turtle Island is either a survivor of the boarding schools, the child, grandchild of a boarding school survivor. And we are still here despite these educational acts of erasure and acts of genocide. Alarmingly, many member states continue to ignore the reality that indigenous peoples live within their imposed borders. Another concern is that member states are moving too quickly towards truth and reconciliation. And I want to be very clear. There can be no reconciliation because there is no point in time to which we can be consiled. Another better future, indigenous future, must be imagined. And reconciliation can't happen when, when it still harms are still being perpetrated against us. It always reminds me of our Turo Wampum, our first treaty with the Europeans in the 1600s, the version of staying in your lane, so to speak. The treaty was offered a way of indigenous and non-indigenous peoples to live peaceably side by side in right relationship with Mother Earth and all living beings, never to be making rules and laws that would affect one another. This treaty is in effect as long as the grass grows and the rivers flow and the sun rises and sets. And that's a relationship that we have today even with the United States. And we recently polished the chain and would like to do so again. I would lastly like to, to end with a one dish and one spoon wampum because I believe that it talks so deeply about the interconnectedness of all living things and all of humanity. One of our earliest treaties, it was with the Anishinaabe. And we agreed to hunt fish in a respectful manner, leaving food for each other and not hunting the woods until it, you know, it was all gone. And making sure that all animal populations would continue to flourish. Like in the Thanksgiving address, we need to we agreed to come together and to be of one heart and one mind. And this wampum treaty reminds us to share Mother Earth. After all, we are sharing one dish and one spoon for all of humanity. And as our Uncle Oren always says, we can exchange our blood, and it doesn't get any closer than that. And we have to remind each other of that. Our recommendations for you, and, and I again, my heart overflows with this report. I can't even begin to tell you the impact that this report is going to have um, for our nations and our peoples going forward. I can't even begin to tell you. I, I actually got choked up at the end of reading these 25 pages. I was so elated. Um, we, we hope that you will also help us to push for a full study on the doctrine of discovery. Um, as we know that we are our own experts and de decisions should not be made about us without us, as you said earlier. Um, and it needs to also include that any de decisions um, that we have to have full prior and informed consent and not merely decisions made on our behalf. We are equal to all other human beings. 
Um, and, and that's something so important to note because till, still today, they try to marginalize us and put us in our place. We are not less than, we are equal to. And, and again, I thank you so much from the bottom of my heart and we'll be using this instrument um, going forward. So thank you very much. Please welcome pre-recorded remarks from Bernadette Dementieff, representing the Gwich'in people and executive director of the Gwich'in Steering Committee. Good afternoon. Bernadette Dementieff Oji, Gwich'ajak Gwich'in Eastley. My name is Bernadette Dementieff and I'm the executive director of the Gwich'in Steering Committee, which was founded in 1988 by the elders and chiefs of the Gwich'in Nation of Alaska and Canada. I am here on behalf of the Wichita Nation at the direction of my elders to share how extremely important our sacred lands to us that resides in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. For over 40,000 years, we migrated with the caribou. We always felt short from going into the coastal plain of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, known to everybody else as Anwar, the Arctic Refuge, but to my people, it's called Izhikwetsan Gondai Godlit. The sacred place where life begins. Since time immemorial, we have had a cultural and spiritual connection to the porcupine caribou herd. This area is so much more than a piece of land or a piece of land with oil underneath. It is our entire being. It is so sacred that we do not step with there. In 1988, at the first Gwich'in gathering that was held in over 150 years, the Gwich'in nation of Alaska and Canada gathered in the Arctic village. And they gave us three directions. And that was to go out and tell the world that we are here to do this work in a good way and not to compromise our position. Now, do this work in a good way it is a very simple sentence, but it is not always easy. Not when you're up against so much dishonesty and misleading statements from your own elected leadership. But we continue to do this work in a good way anyway. And that's the way you work together, the way you talk together, and that's even the way you think about each other. There was a time when we were able to communicate with the animals. We were we were able to communicate with the porcupine caribou herd and we made a vow to each other to always take care of each other. And they have taken care of us for thousands of years. And now it is our turn to take care of them because our land, one that we consider extremely sacred is being turned into an oil field. Could you imagine a church that you attend, a place that you hold very sacred, being bulldozed over. That is how we feel about this area. This is not a place we built. This is a place that we were blessed with. This is a place that Creator blessed us with. And we hold this place to high standard. Our connection to the land, to the water and animals it is all interconnected. There is no one or the other. This is our survival. This is our entire way of life. And uh, you know what happens in the Arctic is going to happen everywhere. We need to start respecting each other's spirituality, each other's religion, as long as you know, your religion doesn't hurt other people. I've always told respect to that. I, we may not believe, we may not all believe the same thing. We may be raised the same way, believe in the same things, but all of our spiritual paths are going to be different because we all have different lives. We are not asking for anything. We're not asking for money, for oil, for jobs. We're simply asking to live off the land that Creator blessed us with. We are asking to be left alone because we understand in our hearts 
that our survival is our land, our water, and our animals. It's, it's really um, hard when people are coming into our homelands, making decisions about our future and not involving us. I'm a, I'm a grandmother and I'm a mother and I worry about my children's future. I worry about my grandchildren's future and that is why I'm using my voice right now. Um, I believe in my heart, one of the most powerful tools that you have is your voice and that you should always use it. You know, I um, personally, I got disconnected from my people and from my, uh, my connection to my homelands. But in 2007, I went to Deshenla, it's a mountain um, that my ancestors used to migrate through when they migrated alongside the caribou. And something just came over me. I was so overwhelmed and I started crying. And I asked Creator for forgiveness for being disconnected for so long. But I, um, I shared back that I'm here now to share my responsibility as a pitch in. And that responsibility is to protect our land, water, and our animals, which protects our way of life. It's hard trying to convince people that will never understand how extremely important our land is to us. It's, it's not easy, but we try. That's all we can do. But we need to ask ourselves that we're going to be on the right side of history. The world don't end when we, when we do. We need to leave some of this world as creator left it. And that's what the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge represents. It's untouched, unspoiled. It's one of the last untouched ecosystems in the world. And it has brought so many people together. So many people from all over the world. This area brought us together. So many people have found their way back to being grounded and we need to understand creation, God's creation. That is what we already have. New York, for instance, when I went there, there was so much concrete. I, <clears throat> I couldn't find anywhere really to get grounded because whenever I come home from traveling, I always have to go out on the river or out on the land and there I couldn't, because um, I was so overwhelmed. And you need nature, you need trees, you need, I mean, even dirt. That may not make sense to some, but I'm sure it makes sense to a lot because this is who we are. This is our way of life. Everything surrounds it. We are interconnected. If something happens to one, then the rest just collapses. So that is why I always need to share that it's important. It's important to respect the indigenous peoples in this world, not just in this country, but in this world. When our elders, um, when we were being told we're going to be rich if we open up the, our sacred land, the oil and gas development, our elders told us that we are already rich, that we were rich in our culture, we were rich in our way of life, and all we have to do is protect it, and that our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren will have a chance at survival. So, you know, what I'd like for people to take home with them is what's your survival? What is your spirituality? What is your connection? And try to understand where we're coming from. You know, we all want our ways of life, our traditions and our cultures to live on. But that includes our land, that includes water, that includes our animals. 
And that is all we are asking for. We respect our spirituality. We deserve the same respect everybody else has. I mean, everybody should know by now that we don't give up. We don't stand down. That we will always fight for our ways of life. And that is interconnected to the land, to the water, and to the animals. It sustains who we are as a people. And we are beautiful people. We come from some of the most amazing people that ever walked this planet. We survived some of the coldest, harshest winters so that we could be here. And we owe that same dedication and respect to our future generations. I'm sure that we all have children or young people that we love. Climate change, don't care what color we are, don't care if we're up river, down river, rich, poor, black or white. We are all going to be negatively impacted and it's time that we start sticking our differences aside and come together because if we don't, our children are gonna be struggling to survive. Our spirituality will be challenged like never before. And we are just here to help all people, not just our own. That's the way we were raised. That's the way we were brought up. So I just hope everyone takes home tonight in their heart that we all deserve respect. We all deserve to keep our spirituality, religion, ways of life as as an indigenous people it is all interconnected can't have one without the other Namaste Chao on behalf of the Gwich'in Nation thank you please welcome Mona Palaka an elder of the Havasupai, Tehua and Hopi peoples she has been a distinguished representative for Native peoples across interfaith communities and in international gatherings on the rights of Indigenous peoples. First of all, I just want to greet each and every one of you. Good evening, and thank you for taking time out from your everyday life to come and join us and um, to um, talk about uh, some very uh, important matters involving our indigenous people, our spiritual practices and our beliefs, our way of life. I represent the Havasupai people, the people of the blue-green water, on my mother's side from down at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. And I'm also Hopi and Tewa, Pueblo nations up in northern Arizona on my father's side. I was raised uh, throughout my life being told that there are certain responsibilities that uh, I have. And part of that responsibility was demonstrated to me through my grandmother my, and my parents and other relatives, elders. And I was told that um, we have what's called the original instructions. The original instructions are our way of life. They're the way that we survive. And the, the most important part of survival for us is our spiritual connection, our relationship with the basic foundations of life, what we call the divine creations, the water, the water that we were birthed from, from our mother's womb, and the water that we use each and every day of our lives. The air we breathe, this air that we first met when we came into this world. The sun, father, son, grandfather, son, dawa, is our sacred fire. And we use these sacred fires in our everyday life. 
our relationship with Mother Earth and all that she gives to us. And that in our sacred relationship with these things, we must always remember that there's a balance that we must maintain. The place in the Grand Canyon, the place of my mother's people, the Havasupai people, I was always told that it's life in a narrow place and there's a very delicate balance that we must maintain. How we take care of it and how it takes care of us. And this was part of our teaching. And that there's a reciprocity, a practice of reciprocity to give before you take. And that giving is our offering, our prayer that we make in order for us to receive the blessings. The Hopi people, we live in a land that's high desert land. There's no rivers, lakes, streams, or waters. What we rely on is our prayer, the offerings we make. And all of these things are done in a sacred cycle. We pray. We make offerings, we sing songs, we do a dance for the cycles of life on Mother Earth. We believe in those prayers that we make. We have faith in our prayers. We must make those prayers in order for us, we believe, for the rain to come, for the water to come to plant, to water our gardens so we would have food, our sacred foods, corn, squash, beans, tobacco that we use for our offerings. We needed to do that, and we still do. Throughout the world, there are indigenous people, human beings just like us, that are they're not separated from their land or nature. These indigenous cultures have an unbroken chain that extends back to the time when our ancestors first emerged on Mother Earth, our origin stories. I can go back down into the Grand Canyon and I can walk the land and I can go to a place where I can see my complete family tree. All of the generations that were here before me that I come from. And I have that understanding of who I am by walking on that land and seeing the water, being in the water that's there. And that is my identity, that is my spiritual connection to the, we know that there is something greater than us, a power that's greater than us that is giving this life energy to us the water, the food we eat, through the plant life, the animal life, all of these things, this is what our spirituality is. This is what our life is. And so throughout my life, I've heard these things. I've been taught these things. And as I begin to travel and go to other places, I've heard this from others all over the world, indigenous people who have not separated themselves from their homelands. We can still find people throughout the world who are still living in their traditional homes, eating their traditional foods, practicing their health care based on their traditions, traditional medicine, plant medicines, earth-based medicine. 
still practicing their spiritual ceremonies, still having, having their own traditional governance, and still practicing an economy that's based on their traditions, our ways of life. In the, some of these communities, we are taught that we have a responsibility. I have a responsibility that I'm upholding. I'm called grandmother. I have grandchildren. And that responsibility as a grandmother, a mother, gives me the authority to speak up for them, the children, grandchildren, the ones that are yet to come, the ones we will not see. Always thinking that there's others that are still coming. And so we make prayers, and, and I was told that my ancestors made prayers for me. And they looked at what was around them that provided them with life. They looked at that and they said, we take only what we need. We leave some for the rest. There's more coming. There, our children are coming, our grandchildren, great-grandchildren, the generations that are still coming. We must take care of it for them. Those were the instructions we were given. There are certain places throughout Mother Earth that we recognize as being places that are sacred, places where we recognize that have special energy, special healing power, and we go there. Special waters, and throughout our contact with the colonizers, there have been many of these sacred places that have been blocked off from us. There are certain places where there are offerings that are made, or what we call shrines. And to anybody else to look at them, we call it a shrine, and it's, a, it's sacred. It's, it's a special place. And it could be thousands of years old. And, it, and to someone else who isn't familiar with it, they might look at it, and it might just be a rock. It might just be a pile of rocks sitting there. But to us, it's our connection with those ancestors that put them there as guides. They're like our map. I asked my mother, how is it? How is it that we as indigenous people were able to live here? We didn't have any maps. We didn't have any road signs. We didn't have roads. How is it that we were able to travel? And she said, oh, she said, you know, there are times when people get lost. They lose their sense of direction. And they feel lost. They may feel, they may physically be lost or they may be spiritually lost or mentally lost. And she said, what we do is we light a fire and we sit down with it and we meditate with it, look into it. And when you do that, you're going to receive direction. You might see in the fire, in the coals, you might see a rock formation, a mountain. You might see some sort of a 
symbol or a sign and you know which way to go. Or you may even just think, have a thought, a feeling about yourself and realize what direction to go in your life. And so these are some of the ways that we, we do our uh, practices of spirituality, of a way of being. And we also are taught our history, our history, our stories. And many of these stories are, are uh, oral history that have been passed on. It's not very often you find uh, literature in about some of the tribal nations, indigenous people. I know that as far as my people, the Havasupai people are concerned, you hardly find anything about us. And many times people never heard of us. But there are also many other tribal nations, indigenous people who have not yet been what we call today recognized. And, and oftentimes today, we think that um, we are in a position that's a big challenge. Our challenge is what to continue to hold on to in our traditions, our culture. What do we hold on to, continue to hold and practice it? And what from Western contemporary society are we going to go ahead and embrace? That's a challenge for us. We as indigenous people are placed, put in a position where we have to go into courts of law, man-made law that are not sensitive or even conscious of our indigenous law, our indigenous laws that are based on natural law. And we're not considered in decisions that are being made about our sacred sites where we, can, we have continuously upheld the prayers, the ceremonies at these places. And so even in our health care, in our medicine, our earth-based medicines that we use, some of these medicines are outlawed. Here in the United States, we have, um, we have the um, Native American church that uses peyote, our earth-based medicine, a sacrament. That's what we call it. And um, it was against the law. It was against the law to practice our um, traditional ceremonies until just recently, until around 1978, when we were given that freedom of religion for American Indians. And one of the elders said to me, she said, um, they want us to go to these um, medical doctors, the Bahana, the white doctors. I go over there, they give me a piece of paper and they tell me, you know, they ask me all these questions I have to answer then they even ask me if I can pay for that care. But at home, I can walk outside. I can go to a cedar tree, walk up to that tree, take a hold of the leaves, feel it, rub my hands together on it, smell it, bless my heart, bless my mind. And I tell that, that tree, that leave, the leaves of the cedar, I tell it, I need your help. 
I don't feel good. I need your help. So I can take some of it. I make an offering. I take some of it. I take it inside. I might burn it, make a smudge, make a smoke, bless myself with it. Makes me feel better. I might make a tea. I might drink it. Makes me feel better. It doesn't ask me any questions. It helps me. So these are some of the kinds of ways of indigenous people have this relationship that we understand, and it's our survival. It's our survival that we are seeking. My Hopi elders told me, they said, know where your water is. Know what's happening to your water. You have to take care of it. Know what's being put into it. Know where your air is, the good, clean, fresh air. Where are you going to go? Places where the air is clean. Know where that's at. They told me, learn how to make a fire without a match. Learn how to create that fire that you're going to need. A flint fire. The old way that we call it, the, that's the real, the real fire, the real sacred fire that's lit that way. He told me, you have to go out there, you have to know where to find your food, where to find your medicine, the plant medicine. That's basic survival. And they told me to go ahead and speak and talk about this. Go ahead and talk to people about it. And they said, it's our responsibility as indigenous people to be the gentle reminders to all people about this basic, basic original instructions. We were given we made a covenant, the Hopi. We have this teaching where we were told we made a covenant, covenant with the Creator when we first came into this world to live here and have everything we have here that takes care of us and gives us life. We made a promise that we would take care of it. And so that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing, and we're making every effort to now be that gentle reminder to all people. Be, all, be a gentle reminder about that instruction that all people were given, the red, yellow, black, and white, that we are all related and that our basic survival is not any different from each other. It's all the same. And so our spiritual practices and beliefs are based on that. They're based on all of these things and all of, I'm, I looked at your, at the report and I was so glad to see the things that were included in there. Very important. I could read the voices of the indigenous people in there. And I felt like uh, my elders, the ones that were here before that are no longer here, the ones that were the first, the ones that went in there into the United Nations and delivered their messages that they are smiling today because this time has come and the acknowledgement 
the acknowledgement of our, the indigenous teachings, understandings about our way of life is being looked at, being acknowledged, and I look forward to seeing what the outcomes are going to be. What is, what is going to come from it? Let it not be a piece of paper that's going to sit somewhere on a shelf. Let it be a guide for improving the quality of life because that's what it is, our life as well as yours, improving the quality of life and establishing this good relationship. And so I come to you here today, tonight, um, with a good feeling in my heart, and I'm grateful to be able to uh, say a few words to you and wish you all the best and blessings to each and every one of you, our families, our homes that we come from, and whatever way we make our offerings of prayer could be recognized in a good way. Esquilly, 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 esquilly. Please welcome pre-recorded remarks from Jose Francisco Calitai, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous People. He is of the Maya Cachiquel in Guatemala. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak to you today, and congratulations to the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion or Belief, past and present for the publication of this important study on the religion rights of indigenous peoples, which I fully endorse. My name is Jose Francisco Calizai. I am the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, appointed by the Human Rights Council in March 2020. I am Amaya Cachiquel from Guatemala, and I have been defending the rights of indigenous peoples for many, many years. Before my appointment as a special rapporteur, I was a member of the Committee for the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, and in 2016, I was the president of the, the committee. The rapporteur, rapporteur report on, on the obstacles and opportunities facing indigenous people's freedom of religions or beliefs comes at a crucial time, and I am happy to see them taking the initiative to address this topic, which I hope will raise awareness of indigenous people's rights. As Mr. Sahid acknowledged, this is a largely overlooked subject. The Special Rapporteur report highlights the role that colonization, forced assimilation, and dispossession have had on indigenous peoples, spiritual, cultural, and physical survival, including religious institutions, led boarding schools where they were prohibited from using their own languages, culture, and spiritual practices. The report identified obstacles to the realizations of indigenous people's religions, religious and spiritual rights, such as the failure of a state to recognize and respect indigenous spirituality in law and policy. The blocking of access to or the destruction of sacred places the stigmatization or restriction of spiritual practices and the failure to, repat to repatriate ceremonial object and uh, so ceremonial object and re remains. In April of this year, the University of Arizona Indigenous People Law in Policy Program, where I am based for the duration of my term, organized a consultation with uh, Mr. Sha Mr. Shahid to gather testimony and input from indigenous peoples, academics, and other experts to contribute to this report. As UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, I received many of the same reports from indigenous people of violation often occurring in the context of extractive industries threatening indigenous people's sacred place. Most recently, from Guyana and Botswana and Namibia, in relation to mining and oil exploration, respectively. Previous, previous special rapporteurs 
on the rights of indigenous peoples have called out the United States for alleged violation of indigenous peoples, religious rights, and relations to the, to the secretion of sacred areas. This includes the building of a telescope on Mauna Kea Mountain in Hawaii, the use of sewage affluent to create artificial snow on the San Francisco peak in, the Arizona, in Arizona, the proposed sale of the Black Hills in South Dakota and the paving over the Sogorea Tea ceremonial and burial site in California. This year, the focus of my report to the UN General Assembly was on protected areas and indigenous people's rights, the obligations of state and international organizations. Conservation measures such as game parks, nature reserves, and world heritage sites often result in the removal, removal of indigenous peoples from their land and resources and impedes access to sacred sites. Forced eviction, killing, physical violence, and abusive prosecution have negatively impacted the ability of indigenous peoples to maintain and transmit their spiritual beliefs. In my report, I also highlight some positive examples and best practices, including the Birds Airs National Monument, which is to be co managed with, the, with five Native American tribes who are tasked with the restoration and protection of the sacred lands, ceremonies, rituals, and traditional use of, of that are part of the nation's way of life. My report concludes with a number of recommendations to states and international organizations, one of which is to learn from indigenous knowledge system to determine, together with indigenous peoples, conservation protocols related to sacred areas or spaces. As the Special Rapporteur on Religion and Belief noted in his report, Indigenous women possess vast amount of religion and spiritual knowledge and are often recognized as spiritual leaders in their communities. I address this in my recent report to the Human Rights Council on Indigenous Women and Development, Application and Preservation and Transmission of Scientific and Technical Knowledge. I discuss how indigenous women in many communities, including South Africa, are, custod are custodians of sacred sites. They lead rituals and they prepare seeds for ceremonies to encourage rain and germination. In Siberia, women hold knowledge about the location of sacred burial grounds. The Maori women of uh, Aotearoa, today New Zealand, have religion protocols for transmission of various types of knowledge along age and gender lines. In Brazil, the Kauaiwete people recognize a shaman mother to teach farming. I welcome the report, uh, the reporter's emphasis on the role of indigenous women and the importance of land rights to the protection of indigenous religion and beliefs. I would therefore like to consider this report as an integral part of the work of my mandate for the advancement of the right of indigenous peoples to raise awareness and facilitate dialogue around the protection of their religion and their spiritual rights. I would like to conclude a with a final reflection that indigenous peoples, religion and their spiritual beliefs are often place-based and deeply interconnected with their lands and resources. Therefore, therefore protecting indigenous people territories is essential to safeguarding their religion beliefs. I thank you very much for this invitation again. Please welcome Professor Nazila Ganea, current Special Rapporteur for Religion or Belief. Thank you very much. There's very little left to say, but uh, I do want to acknowledge how enriched I feel after today and how moved I've been by many of the presentations. Uh, today and tomorrow are holy days for me, and I changed my planned return to the UK in order to be with you, and I'm so delighted that I did so. We know that in international human rights law, the right to have, adopt, and change religion or belief is protected as is the right to manifest that religion or belief. 
The whole objective of freedom of religion or belief has always been to protect the realm of conscience and the freedom that that offers to our humanity, to our reality, to exploring reality, to living authentically with what we believe. Um, that includes obviously the right to be able to interpret and to manifest according with that conscience. So the way of life and worldview fits in incredibly harmoniously with that. It has always been clear in the standards, at least in theory, that there is no distinction between recognized and unrecognized, between those that are the state religion and other religions or beliefs, between the majority and historical or the newer and other. It has always been the case, it is in all of the standards that this should have been so, but alas, it really hasn't. It should not be that what is familiar to us in terms of the structure of religion, the leadership of religion, what lived religion looks like, should not have been ever restricted. We should always, human rights law should always have offered us a platform of openness and curiosity about seeing the manifestation and reality of religion or belief in all of its diversity. Um, it's not for the government to decide who is or isn't a religion or belief. It should be an objective existence of the reality of the existence of a, a variety of religions or beliefs. It should be guided by self-definition and courts should not intervene in the questions of existence, non-existence and those that are, should be categorized as religion or belief or not. Um, you know, it, it might seem unbelievable that this has always been set out in this way, yet so poorly um, actually delivered. But I, you know, I challenge you to look at the Krishna Swami report from 60 years ago, from to General Comment 22, that interprets um, the key provision, Article 18, um, by the Human Rights Committee. And all of this was already delineated and clear in those standards. But erasure, non-recognition, and ongoing patterns of severe violations with multiple overlapping human rights concerns have indeed been the reality of many indigenous people's practice of religion or belief. Um, so this report is historical, it's significant, and it's the first time that there has been a standalone report after th 36 years of mandate practice by free, you know, the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion and Belief. Certainly, indigenous peoples have been acknowledged and addressed in past reports, country reports and thematic reports, but it's the first time that there is a, a whole report dedicated to this issue. It was long overdue, and I'm deeply grateful to Professor Shahid for having produced this report. Um, the importance of it is, of course, for indigenous peoples, but it's also beyond that. There are wider lessons to be drawn about how we view human rights, that we should not manipulate it or restrict it according to the impoverished, our own mental universe, which is obviously limited and restricted. That, that human rights have that openness in order to understand and appreciate and listen. Uh, this report will therefore enrich the discourse, it, it will enrich the understanding, uh, and it, it has the potential even to carry forward uh, lessons for freedom of religion or belief of many, many others as well. Um, I acknowledge the limitations of the human rights discourse, but you know, within the limitations of it, um, I think the heavy lifting regarding indigenous peoples and freedom of religion or belief has now been done you know, at, the, you know, at the level of the standard or explaining um, this, this universe of understanding around indigenous peoples and freedom of religion or belief. It is now on the record of the mandate in a very clear and illustrative report. It is going to be a reference point for the mandate, but also for the mandate of the special rapporteur on indigenous peoples. It will become integrated in all of our discussions going forward. So any country that is visited, any theme that is addressed in the future will be mindful of indigenous peoples. Already we have heard of state delegations, envoys, ambassadors, intergovernmental groups, that you know, the existence of this report has, has extended their mental universe, legal universe, to appreciating the significance of the omission of this as um, in the past. 
And of course, it provides the opportunity for dialogue with other UN entities, with the special rapporteur, the permanent forum, the expert mechanism, uh, also with all the mandates relating to minority rights, because of course, indigenous peoples are more than minorities, but they are also minorities in legal speak. So they are minorities and indigenous peoples. So all the minority instruments should also engage with it. And obviously the UN Human Rights Committee as well. Um, I welcome ongoing engagement and I look forward to the mandate being enriched by this perspective and your reality in the years going forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. I am here to close us out. I uh, am so grateful, Professor Ganea, for those uh, wonderful words. And I know that many of us are moved to hear about the expansion of, of the mental universe and your intention and the ethos and conscience that you're bringing. So we, we very much look forward to working together. I also, um, all of us here who want to get behind this, this, uh, this report, I also want to remind people that the actual report is available online and we will have it, a uh, link to it featured prominently on our Center for Earth Ethics website, but of course you can also go to the Office of the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion or Belief uh, website and, and read it. it is, there's so much excellent work in there that has, has been said. To Professor Shahid, thank you for that work. Thank you for your address. Uh, we're deeply grateful and honored by your presence. And thank you to all of the respondents. It was m moving uh, deeply. And um, we're all grateful. We'll be keeping those words, I know, in our hearts as we leave this place. I want to say thank you to everyone at Center for Earth Ethics who came together to make this possible, um, and especially to Tim Cross and Shannon Smith, to Jeannie Cooper-Newton, to Alyssa Eng, to Teddy Nalwanji, and uh, most especially to Aja Tukros, who has been the project manager from this for the beginning. Thank you, Aja. Also known as the voice of God, as they call it in, in, in this production. Uh, appropriately so, thank you. And I want to say, um, finally, thank you very much to, to two people um, who are here who are connected to CEE, uh, Roberto Barrero, um, who is an advisor who from the very beginning helped us to understand the opportunity that presented itself um, with the, the publication of this report, who is Taino, who we're grateful to be in relationship with and to Betty Lyons, who is, among other things, co-chair of our Center for Earth Ethics Advisory Board. We're so grateful for your guidance and support. And of course, I want to also give my acknowledgement to Chief Dwayne Perry. We're so happy and honored that you're here. And finally, I just want to say, um, well, first of all, apologies for anything I left out. And finally, I just want to say uh, that this is a conversation starter. I heard you use that phrase, uh, Professor Shahid, um, and we take that to heart. And at Center for Earth Ethics, we would like to commit ourselves to holding whatever conversations and whatever strategic planning meetings um, are most appropriate to carry this work through. Um, as Mona uh, Polaka so, so wisely um, taught and mandated us, uh, this must not just be a piece of paper, and uh, we want to ensure that from Center for Earth Ethics uh, in any way we can. So thank you very much to all of you. Have a wonderful evening. <laughs>